guys, Liz from The Nail Hub here, and I am back for another Q&A session. I've been collecting questions over the last several weeks. Um, I've got them here on my iPad. I tried to go through and select um, not only some awesome comments that really motivate me to do more videos, but also some questions that I feel like a lot of you have been asking, and hopefully it's something that this is gonna be common across a bunch of people, not just for one specific individual. Um, so without further ado, let's get into um, our first question. I know this video isn't brand new, but I'm hoping you can still help me with this question. Why do people complain that once they start doing their nails, they end up brittle after a while? Is it a bad professional job or are customers not taking care of their nails properly? Just curious, thanks. This is a really good question. So one of the biggest things about getting your nails done, and I would say that this is, for whatever reason, maybe I'm biased because I'm a gel nail technician, but I do feel like gel gets much more of a bad rap than any other nail product out there. When people say their nails were damaged, I mean, sometimes people will say, oh, I ripped off my acrylics, right? Or I tore them off. And they kind of know that they're damaging their nails when they take off their artificial nail because it's just much more of a process. But I find that when we're talking about gel, because gel is more of a flexible product and it's a little bit easier to peel in one piece, I feel like clients don't understand that they are damaging their nails every time they peel off their gel polish. So I think one of the biggest things that really impacts people's nail health is taking off their product by themselves. I know a ton of people, including my own mom, even me, um, that you, you, you're on the road or you're, you, know, you're, you don't have all the supplies to be able to remove your product or maybe you don't even know what you have on your nails. Maybe you have hard gel and you try and soak it off at home and it doesn't come off and you're like, oh my gosh, I just want to take these off. And I also know that there is that weird anxious feeling that sometimes people get when, when they start staring at their nails too much and they go, I'm going to take this stuff off. And I'm not sure why we get that sensation, but it does happen to me even once in a blue moon. And then you just start picking and pretty soon all your nails are peeled off and you're like, oh my gosh, what did I just do? And it is painful and your nails don't feel very good afterwards, but for whatever reason we find ourselves doing it. And then we go back and we blame the product, at least a lot of people do. And they say, gel ruined my nails. I'm never going to do it again. My nails are so weak and so brittle. And really it's because when you take off your product by yourself and you just rip that stuff off, I've seen some horrible videos about people using dental floss or like trying to pry stuff in between the product and the nail and peeling it all off. You end up taking a lot of layers with your product. So if you think about your nail is a bunch of different layers, almost like phyllo dough, you know, like you make baklava, it's probably a weird analogy, but whenever I think of a nail plate, I think of phyllo dough. Phyllo dough is like that really crispy, like croissant style where it has lots of little layers that all flake together. It's kind of what our nail plate looks like. So when you peel off your gel polish or your hard gel nails or your acrylic nails, whatever type of nails you've got on, if you peel those off, you're gonna take off several layers of that nail plate, okay? So think about peeling a croissant or peeling off layers of baklava, which is one of my favorite things. And if we peel off layers, that's exactly what you're doing to your nail plate. And our nail plate takes about six whole months to completely grow back. Depending on the length of your nail bed and how fast your nails grow, it can be anywhere between four to six, maybe even a little bit more for certain fingers. Um, but it takes about six months. So if you think about, you get your nails done, you peel them off, you get your nails done, you peel them off, and you're doing that even on a monthly basis, you're peeling off the same spot. So your nail is getting thinner and thinner and thinner. So that is one of the biggest ways that people feel that their nails get damaged when they have product on them, is when you remove it without using a professional method. Um, and I'm not saying you have to go to a professional to remove your nails, but you do want to take great care in the way that you remove your nails and how often you remove them. And that's why I've been talking about overlays on this channel. I've been showing you guys how to backfill your nails rather than taking everything off every time. And I've also shown you two different methods. If you go back to some of my previous videos, I show you how to properly remove gel polish, what it should look like when this stuff comes off, how long you need to soak it in acetone for um, in order to get that product to come off easily with Without taking any of your natural layers. So that's probably one of the biggest ways that people's nails get damaged is the removal process. The other way that people's nails get brittle and damaged after wearing gel polish is because of the application process. So if we think about we want to 
buff the surface of the nail and sometimes nail technicians or even people doing it themselves, they do a little bit more of an aggressive job than they need to. And also depending on the product you're using, some products, if they're not very high quality, they do need you to rough up the nail a lot in order for them to adhere. And that's why I always tell people, if your product requires you to just scuff up that nail to the nth degree, then maybe you should look for a different product that has better ingredients in it because really we don't want to be removing layers of that nail plate as we're applying the product, okay? So I talked about that phyllo dough taking off layers of our nail plate. If we do that during removal and we also do that during application and we're doing that every two to three weeks, think about how thin your nail is going to get, right? Your nail, when it grows out two or three weeks, only has maybe a few millimeters of new growth. So if you constantly are reapplying product and you're filing and filing and filing during the removal process and reapplication process, your nail is going to get so much thinner as it goes along and your nails are gonna feel so weak. And I do find that clients often, they use gel to grow out their natural nails and as soon as they get some beautiful natural length, they go, oh, I'm gonna get rid of my gel polish, I'm just gonna go back to natural. Now your nail is thinned out because you've been doing that reapplication process with too much filing in between and you're also used to that rigid feel of gel. So when you go to take it off, your nails are gonna feel completely worn out. You're also gonna be able to feel things like heat and cold. You're gonna have much more sensation in your fingers because your nerve endings are gonna be that much closer to the surface of your nail plate. So if you think about it, it's like you've been scraping away at something, shaving away at something, and then you put a protective coating over it, and when you take that protective coating off, it's gonna feel really weird and your nails are gonna feel weird because you haven't had natural nails in a long time, and they're probably gonna be much thinner than they were because of that filing process. The actual gel does not do anything to your nail. Having gel on your nail does not change the health of your nail whatsoever. It does not change the way that your nail grows. The way that we actually affect our nails are over prepping, being harsh during removal, and also the tools that we use if you're you know, using too harsh of a cuticle pusher, if you're scraping away, if you're doing things like that, and also the frequency of what you're doing, that's how you're going to damage your nails. So very long-winded answer, obviously, for something as simple as how does gel damage your nails or why do people think gel damages your nails? But the true answer is it's the human element of doing nails is what really affects our nail health. And if you really pay attention to how your nails are being prepped and how the product is being removed, your nails will be much more intact. And if you think about it, if you like doing your nails often, just like dyeing your hair, and I've talked about this during my overlay videos, if you really like having your nails done all the time, don't take the product off every two weeks, okay? Get yourself an overlay, get yourself some artificial nails that can be backfilled. That way you're only touching that one spot on your nail probably once in the entire process because you're adding more product to the back and you're not removing everything every single time. I've used the hair analogy many times on this channel. When we dye our hair, we don't strip all of the color out of our hair, right? We just add more to the roots and we kind of blend as we go. That's exactly what a backfill is. A backfill on a nail is instead of taking everything off, we're gonna add more product to the part that's grown out and we're going to blend that in to the original product that we had on there, just like hair color. We don't wanna strip our hair every time we dye it. We wanna add to it, keep the ends healthy. And as this grows and we know how long it takes hair to grow, we want to maintain the health of our hair while we're adding to the new growth. And that's exactly the same thing as nails. When they grow out, we wanna maintain that health of our nail out here and add more product to the back and hopefully only manipulate that nail maybe once or twice in any given spot. That's gonna save your nails from a lot of wear and tear, okay? So I hope that helps. Um, next question. When I do my own nails, which I extend to medium length with nail forms, they never break, lift, or chip. But when I do a simple overlay on other people on relatively short natural nails, some nails always chip or lift at the free edge only. Using same products, what am I doing wrong on those short overlays? Your videos are awesome, I've watched all of them. Thanks for sharing your knowledge, it has helped me tremendously. This is a really good question. Okay, so I wanted to kind of use maybe some little things I have here in my studio to kind of explain what is going on. So let me just grab something simple that I have here, okay? I'm gonna pretend that my iPad is my actual nail 
And I'm just gonna use something really simple. I'm gonna use a table towel as my extension, okay? So I am going to pretend like I extended the length of my iPad, you can see my iPad's under there, okay? And I'm just gonna wrap this around to kind of demonstrate what we're doing with the gel, okay? So here is, let me put this evenly so you guys can see, okay? So let's pretend that now I've put product over the entire nail, this is the fake part, and I've got my original nail inside, right? And now we've encapsulated it in product. And if we look at the, the gel down, down the extension, you're gonna see your natural nail, and then you're gonna see all the fake product, right? Okay, so the point here is that when anything touches the end of the nail, water, rubbing it on stuff, touching things with your fingertips, whatever, it's going to be touching the artificial product, not your real nail underneath. So the ability for that product to take pressure, rubbing, scrubbing, water, whatever that touches it on the end, even if you were to scratch in the dirt, your natural nail is kind of encapsulated inside of the artificial product. So that's why when we extend the nail, even ever so slightly, it tends to last longer because we're kind of capping the end of the natural nail and now we've got all this fake product out here that nothing really happens to it, right? Especially with hard gel, literally like almost nothing will mess with hard gel. So um, it is kind of once we think about what we're doing and how that anything that the client is touching with their fingertips or even yourself, if you're doing this on short nails, um, with longer nails and with fake product, then we've got this fake product here and our natural nail is all the way inside and it's kind of encapsulated, okay? And um, when we have our nail grown out and it's like an overlay, okay? This is basically what it looks like when it's an overlay, okay? So our natural nail is right here on the edge, just like that. We put fake product on top of it, we put the gel on top of it, but the edge of our real nail and the edge of our gel are right on the same plane. They're right on the same spot, okay? So any rubbing or anything, if we think about like this, right? Our nail gets kind of rubbed and scrubbed and water gets in here and dirt. So as soon as any little bit starts to lift away from that natural nail, pretty soon stuff can start to get in between. Usually water is one of the biggest culprits because if you remember from my previous video, I was showing you guys how water makes the nail swell and then it shrinks when it dehydrates. And so that swelling and dehydrating really works away from the product because the product doesn't absorb any water, it's plastic. So our natural nail is kind of bending and flexing and it works its way away from the product. And then once we have that and we have just the teeniest little space in between, pretty soon over a two week period or maybe even less, a week usually is when you start to see chipping and separation you're gonna get stuff in between, it's gonna separate and you're gonna to start to see that peeling, okay? So you're gonna see your natural nail peeling away on the end, you're gonna see space in between right on the free edge. If it's only happening at the free edge and everything else up by the cuticle area is perfectly attached, everything in the middle is perfectly attached, then you know it's not your preparation. You know that the product is working, it's cured, it's attached to the nail plate, but whatever is happening with wear and tear is causing it to separate at the free edge. So the way that I would recommend that you fix this, especially with overlays, is when I do overlays, I usually cap the free edge four different times. I cap it when I do my base, I cap it when I do my artificial product, and I really put a lot of product on the end of the nail. Even when I do my color, I also do that. And then I also like to file out the underside of the natural nail. So when I'm doing overlays, really what ends up happening by the end of the service is like this. There's a teeny, teeny little layer of gel that sticks out past the natural nail. And what we want is we want that gel to be a little bit past the natural nail so that over that two to three week process with the rubbing and all of that stuff, it's never going to touch the natural nail. It's never going to be rubbing right on that and we're not gonna get that separation. So the reason why I cap and all that stuff is so that I end up with this teeny, teeny microscopic layer of gel that's just over the edge of the natural nail. It really helps to protect that overlay. It keeps it from separating. So if you're working on short nails and the person does want to do an overlay, I usually put nail forms, even if I'm not going to extend the nail at all. I like to put nail forms on just so that I can put gel out and then I can even file that into shape even though the person wants short, natural looking length. I still usually will put forms on so that I'm able to put gel out there without getting it all over their skin, especially if their nail is you know, back behind the tip of their fingernail and you're gonna be accidentally touching their skin the whole time. Put nail forms on. That way you're able to put all the product that you need, you're able to kind of build it out as you do your base and your overlay and your color and your top coat. And then at the end, you can go back and just barely file the free edge, make it smooth, and it will be kind of encapsulated. So we're gonna like cover that natural nail 
Nothing's going to touch the natural nail. It's not going to be out there in the elements. And over the two to three weeks, it's going to last much better for you. Okay, so that is why we kind of cap the free edge when we do gel polish. But with an overlay, when we want that to last between fills, you have to do that even more so. Okay, so think about that. Put forms on. Make sure that your gel is extending out past the natural nail just ever so slightly. And like I said, I also like to take my e-file. Oops, sorry, I'm throwing bits. I also like to take my e-file at the end, usually in between um, services, you know, like when people come back for fills. I like to come and kind of file out that natural nail just on the edge so that that gel is always the first thing that might touch anything that the client's going to touch because it's going to last a lot better than a natural nail will. So I usually file out a little bit right here on the edge um, and I do it kind of at a 45 degree so that it kind of blends the, nail, the natural nail out and it leaves that gel on the very, very edge of it. So that's something to check and continue to check that every time the client comes back because that is usually the first thing to happen when you've got an overlay situation is the overlay is going to stay on perfectly as far as like the majority of the nail but usually what happens is you get lifting at the free edge and then that's also when the client gets frustrated because their nails get stuck in their hair they can feel stuff getting stuck in between they can see stuff getting stuck in between and that is when that little anxious voice in our head says pick it off so then the client picks off their overlay. Obviously, overlays are much more difficult to remove than regular gel polish. They're gonna peel off their entire nail, and now you're gonna have a very flimsy, weak nail to work on. So it's kind of like this vicious cycle, going back to my first question and now answering your question. So I hope that helps um, keep that little microscopic edge, maybe even like a millimeter, like think about like even like the thickness of a credit card. Usually overlay should be the thickness of a credit card, but I also like to think about the thickness of a credit card past the nail is what I want to maintain as far as product protecting that natural nail. Because as we use our nails and we use our fingertips, our gel gets worn down, especially with soak off gel. It's more porous, it changes shape, it can get rubbed off. So we want those nails to last three weeks, two to three weeks usually. With overlay, sometimes I try to push it to three to four, depending on the client. So if we want those nails to withstand three weeks of rubbing, then we've got to put that much more product on the tip of the natural nail, okay? So I hope that helps. All right, let's see here. Liz, thank you so much for these informative videos. Between you and Susie from Nail Career Education, hi Susie, just in case you're watching this, um, which is how I found you, I can walk into salons and with confidence know if the tech is doing me dirty and being shady by cutting corners or doing something inappropriate or not. And it helped me comb through my local salons and find the best nail technician. I remember when I first started getting acrylic nail enhancements and the first few techs I went to used e-files for everything and the wrong bits to the harsh, wrong bits too harsh for the nail plate, always nicked the heck out of my epinicium as well and always wanted to remove everything each time and reapply instead of filling as needed and filing. And would always rip it off instead of soaking the product off. And I'm certainly, and I'm certain they probably didn't sanitize their equipment looking back on everything. So just thank you, thank you, thank you for the informative videos you've done to help us common folks out. This makes me so freaking happy because it's a win-win, okay? This is exactly why I started these videos on YouTube is because I saw this happening. I saw a disconnect between nail techs, well, not a disconnect. I saw a, a correlation between nail techs telling me I'm losing clients like clients are stopping getting their nails done because people were getting frustrated they were saying my nails are getting ruined by product they are getting ruined every time I go to the nail salon and so what that does is it scares clients and they stop going to nail salons and then they start doing stuff at home and the nail technicians are like oh my gosh my business is going under all my clients are leaving or I can't convince clients to do what I do because they're they've had you know traumatizing experiences so this is really cool because what it means is is that average Joes and you know don't take that as a bad thing I'm just saying like normal people who just like getting their nails done are able to watch these videos and learn about, like she used the word epinicium in this question, which is so cool. Um, or I should say comment rather than question, but she used the word epinicium, which I think is so cool that, you know, an average Joe is using technical terms that you're able to discern what's a good nail technician, what's a bad nail technician. And again, even with people, you know, doing you dirty or being shady, I still don't believe that any nail technician on the planet gets into doing nails because they want to be shady or they want to hurt people. Most nail technicians, they have a heart of freaking gold and they love doing nails, 
but there isn't great education in our industry. And so I really feel for nail technicians because I've been there and I know there's a lot of people that are in that situation where we want to do a good job, but we don't know we're doing a bad one because we haven't been taught what we're supposed to do. The beauty schools are horrendous. I hope that soon we figure out a way to fix that situation because it is ridiculous how little education people are getting in their beauty school um, settings. And when they come out, all they want to do is do pretty nails. They want to make people happy, but they end up making mistakes inadvertently because they weren't taught how to do things. And the technology keeps changing and things keep getting more complex. So it's very challenging for nail technicians to stay at that kind of upper crust per se. Um, and so I feel for it, but I'm really glad that what it did is it helped you find a good nail technician. And I'm glad that helped match you guys up because there are great nail technicians out there. There are people that are learning and trying to strive to do the very best job that they can. And if these videos can help anyone find clients or clients help, you know, it helps clients find nail technicians, then my job is done. So Thank you, thank you, thank you. This makes me so happy. Seriously, it like, makes me want to cry almost because I'm so happy that that is just like the coolest thing ever. So anyway, glad that works for you. I'm glad these videos are helping. And absolutely, like this is the whole goal. The whole goal is to educate everybody so everyone can find the best possible situation for their business, for themselves. And no matter whether you choose to go to a nail salon or you choose to do your own nails because you love doing nails, more power to you. I just want you to do it right so that your nails stay healthy and we don't have any bad experiences. All right, next question. Liz, how did you become an educator? This is a very good question and it's kind of a long story, so hopefully I don't bore anyone. Um, but being an educator in our industry is really kind of an odd situation because really what an educator usually means is that you're more of a sales representative. But let me go back and kind of talk about my whole evolution as you know Liz in the nail industry. So I actually started as just a behind the chair nail technician. My husband and I decided that we wanted to quit our corporate jobs. We wanted to become entrepreneurs. And so we opened a nail salon. I got my, my license to be a nail technician. I worked in the salon. I worked with some awesome people in the salon as well. We were very successful. It was a great run. And as I started working in the salon, I started to find products that I loved. So one of the first products that I finally found after so much wasted money, wasting it on crappy product, which I've talked about also many times on this channel, took me forever to find high quality stuff. And finally, I came across a brand called Accents. Accents is a Canadian company. And I found them actually through another educator named Gina Silvestro, who is their um, one of their international educators. She's an awesome, awesome, awesome nail technician and educator. And so I finally found her, I think through social media. Um, I went and took a class with her. She was using this product called Accents. She let me borrow it and let me try it. And I was like, oh my gosh, this stuff actually works. I'm so happy. So I was in Orlando. I went to the Premier Orlando show, which is one of the biggest, if not the biggest trade show in our industry, in the country for nails and beauty stuff. I went to Premier Orlando and I said, you know what? This stuff works. I had wasted so much money on other stuff. I was like, I am going to buy this product. I'm going to buy all of it. I'm going to take it back to my salon and we're going to use it. So that's literally what I did. I bought, I think like $3,500 worth of product while I was at Premier Orlando. And it was a godsend because the stuff actually worked. We started with their Accents Options Gel, which I've used also here. It's the potted soak off product. And I was just so happy. So I started using it. I started posting that our salon was using it and I just really liked it. And then not long after... I got um, an invitation to go to Canada, to Vancouver, to go to Accents headquarters and basically try out to be an educator. So it was like a three-day course, um, kind of, you know, I don't know if I would call it a trial, but it was, it was kind of, I went and I, they had some training and there was like 20 other people there. And so after the three days, we took an exam and it was one of those things where they were looking, they're basically doing tryouts for educators to see like who had good nail quality, who was able to teach, who was able to speak in public. And really what these companies are looking for, um, if you're interested in becoming an educator and you know, at the Nail Hub, we have Accents because it is just, it's such a good product and it's, you know, who I started with and I am an educator for Accents and I really believe in their product. And we also have other amazing products as well because my whole thing with my experience of going through all of those crappy products was 
I want to find good products that people can trust. I want stuff that cures. I want stuff that's high, pig high pigmentation. I want stuff that a nail technician knows when they apply it, it's going to work. Rather than having to think of like, oh, I have to do it this way with this thing, with this, and they have to come up with all these crazy concoctions in order for the nails to turn out. I wanted to really have some vetted products and curate some products for people. And that's really how the nailhub.com was born is that as I started using products and as I started educating and as I started, you know, really experimenting and learning more about gel and, you know, using it and all of that stuff, I really wanted to kind of eliminate that risk and put stuff up there that I know I can put my, my, you know, hand to the sky and say, this stuff is really, really good. So that's how the nailhub.com was born. And obviously some of the products like Accents, Accents is for professional nail technicians only. Um, it doesn't mean you have to have a license because there's a lot of countries that don't have licensing, but um, you do need to be a professional nail technician. So we do have some brands like that on our website, but we also have other brands that people can purchase that um, are, you know, for everyone, right? Um, and Astemio is one of those. Astemio is an awesome product, very high quality that anyone can get access to. And I really, I'm going to continue to curate both professional only and everybody can have them brands because I think that's really important to not only have high quality product for professionals, but also have high quality product for people who want to do their nails at home because we don't want you using stuff from random countries that's full of chemicals that isn't regulated that you're going to get allergies from and that's why I always tell people like it's all great to find cheap product and I understand that's a big thing for do-it-yourselfers is that you're like oh yay I found five dollar gel polish but you have to really think about what's in that five dollar gel polish because you can easily develop allergies from crappy gel because of the chemicals that they use and once you develop those allergies or you know if something worse happens it can really destroy your nails it can really destroy your health and you'll never be able to come back from that. I've never seen anyone become non-allergic after being allergic. So anyway, that's my two cents, and I kind of deviated there for a second. But an educator really, if you think about it, is someone who can professionally represent the brand, okay? So that's what these companies are looking for. And when we say educator, it is an educator because we do teach people how to do nails, but it's very specific when you're an educator for a company. When you're an educator for a company, they want you to promote their product, which why shouldn't you? It's if, it, if you find a company that you like, if you find a culture that you like, and if they have awesome products, I mean, why wouldn't you be proud promoting that? And I am very proud to promote all the products that we have at the Nail Hub. Um, and it is kind of a sales representative role. So one of the things that they look for as an educator is that you are able to speak in public, you're professional, that you're obviously a good nail technician. Being a good nail technician is like, the baseline requirement for being an educator, right? Because they want to make sure that you do great nails. Um, but being a good teacher, are you able to explain things? Do you understand all of the ins and outs? And I think if you want to be an educator, you should be an educator. But what I will tell you is don't be an educator just because you think you're going to be famous, okay? That is like one of the biggest misconceptions. Being an educator is actually so much work. It usually takes you away from working in the chair it is one of those things where you cannot do it all. Um, and so you really need to pick and choose what type of career do you want to have? Do you love working in the chair? Do you love working on clients? Or do you want to get out there? Are you, is, is educating your calling, you know, is that really what you want to do? Um, maybe you want to get into something else. Maybe you want to develop your own line. Maybe you want to become a chemist. Maybe you, you want to, you know, um, get into selling product, you know, whatever it is. And it is kind of this natural evolution that as you try things, you kind of see, oh, that's not for me, or I'm really good at this, or whatever. Just like with the salon, I was a great nail technician, I am a great nail technician, I'm a great educator, but I hated owning a salon. I absolutely hated it. Like, I was not good at it, and I'm much more of an introvert, I'm much more of like a lone wolf type of personality, I'm just being honest. And I think that you have to be honest with yourself and say, I'm not just going to do something because that's what I'm supposed to do or that seems like the next level. There really aren't any next levels in this industry. There's really no next levels anywhere. I think we just put that in our brains. So I just wanted to say that because I feel like the educator thing, people think I'm nobody if I don't become an educator or I'm nobody if I don't make it to these specific milestones. But if you think about it, there really are no milestones. It what It's what makes you happy. So being an educator makes me happy. I love teaching. Um, and, you know, I have kind of 
branched out and I'm a little bit more of a free agent than I used to be, but I try to always represent everything very professionally and I do believe wholeheartedly in the products that we represent and I'm very grateful, very, very, very grateful to Accents and all of the people that have helped me along the way and that's an important thing to realize is that part of being an educator is an evolution and there are lots of relationships and things that come into play as you evolve in your nail career and you always want to cherish that. You always want to think about, wow, like that that meeting that I had, you know, that that happening upon Gina with accents is how I got started with an awesome product in my salon and how I became an educator. And I'm very grateful for all of those experiences. And that's part of how you become an awesome educator is you build on those experiences. You build on that expertise and that skill set and you try to funnel that all into something that you can share with someone else. So that's kind of how I became an educator. I, you know, I got approached, I went and I did a tryout and I, you know, I passed and I got my certificate and I started teaching classes. And the other thing I wanted to say about being an educator is that it really is on you. Um, a lot of people have the misconception that if you get swooped up by a company, they are going to, you know, pay you lavishly and they are going to set up everything and you're just going to walk in like some famous person plop down and start teaching. That is not the case at all. Being an educator is for self-starters. It is for people that want to get out there and do it themselves, that are not afraid to do a class with two people because that's all they could get on their first try. Um, and it is really about you. It has nothing to do with the company making you do things or helping you do things. It really is more of a self-starting type of thing. And um, they basically give you the opportunity to represent a product that you love, to belong to a family, and there are lots of great companies in our industry that you know do that very, very well. Um, sometimes people start as an educator with a certain company and they realize that that company's culture doesn't match with them so that they might hop around a little bit and try and find a better culture for them. It really is more than just the product. It's kind of like doing good nails is the baseline for being an educator. Having a good product is the baseline for people wanting to be an educator for your company. It's really more than that. It's about you know, what the experience is like, the culture, the family feeling. If you want a family feeling, maybe you want something that's a little bit more corporate. I mean, there's just so many nuances. But at the end of the day, I always say, become an educator because you want to teach, because you want to share, not because you want to make money, not because you want to be famous. Being an educator is really about sharing. Just like I do on this channel, I still consider myself an educator because I share, I teach, I help people. And I'm not so much of a corporate company sales representative anymore. I've kind of developed my own thing, but I proudly represent all of the products that we list on the nailhub.com. I'm very, very grateful for all of the amazing companies that work with us and that I'm able to interact with. I just, I love working in this industry. It makes me so happy and all the amazing relationships that I've built. I am so grateful and I always try to do those companies justice when I talk about their products because I know how much hard work goes into developing products. It's very difficult and I always try to make sure that I show people that half of the battle is knowing how to use it properly and what it was intended for and that's exactly what this channel is for. So anyway, super, super long answer to that. I love explaining things and I kind of deviate so hopefully I stayed on course with that answer but being an educator is not about being insta-famous at all. I hope that you guys understand that. It is really about the intent of wanting to share knowledge. And the other thing I will say is that it's very difficult to be an educator and to share knowledge if you still don't have a lot of knowledge. So don't hop into being an educator super early on in your career. It's very difficult to do that because there is an element of experience that you need to be able to share. So I always tell people like, don't hop out of the chair into education right away. Um, I think it's very important to gather experience, to dabble, to, you know, just experience working in the chair, period. And then if you want to teach, then that's great. But also realize that teaching and anything else is going to pull you away from the chair time. It's going to pull you away from other things because you really can't do it all. There's not enough hours in the day. And so I want you to really consider that if you do become an educator, you're going to have to sacrifice time somewhere else. And you just need to be ready to make that decision. So hope that helps. 
Wow, that was a super long answer to a very simple question, but I hope that helps you guys because there's just so much to it. Like being, a, I think any other educator, like for example, my buddy Selena, I guarantee you Selena would say the exact same thing. Like people come up to us and they're like, oh my God, I want to be an educator. And it's just, if they knew what goes in to being an educator, they probably wouldn't want to be one because it's a lot of hard work. It's just a lot of sweating behind the scenes. It's a lot of just, it's awesome, but at the same time, it's just a lot of work. So if you, you know, if you, want the glitz and glam and that's all you really want, then I would say don't become an educator because it is really not about glitz and glam. It's a lot of just work. It's just work. And if you love it, then great. I love it, but it's not for everybody. So, and if it doesn't, it doesn't matter if it's not for you, don't feel bad because there are some amazing people that just do nails. And I don't want to say just do nails because I'm not trying to minimize that. I'm just saying like, if you focus your energy into doing nails on clients, I actually miss that. I miss working in the salon. I miss being fully booked every single day. And it's just, there's awesome pieces to all parts of our industry. So don't feel pressured to do something just because you see other people doing it. Do what makes you happy because we are very lucky to be able to do nails as a career. It makes me so happy. Not many people get to do what they love for their career. So stick with it even within your career. Stick with that happiness vibe. Do what makes you successful both emotionally and financially. Okay. Um, let's see, Liz, how would you answer if someone asked you, does UV light cause cancer? Oh my gosh, this is such a crazy question. I kind of like grabbed these because I knew they were good, but I haven't really prepared answers to these because I wanted it to be a little bit candid. I didn't want to, you know, be over prepared. Um, okay. The cancer question is a very, very big, what do you call it? Loaded question. Um, so yes, uh, the UV light that we use in nail lamps is the same UV light that comes from the sun. It's UVA rays. Um, and yes, it is the same kind that can cause skin cancer. I'm not going to uh, negate that at all. The difference is the quantity of light that we are exposing ourselves with. And there have been several studies on this on both sides of the fence. Um, obviously, there are people in the industry and also across media outlets that want to kind of use these topics to gather forces, right? So like, it's just like anything. It's like political things, right? It's like there's some issue and there's people on both sides of the issue. And sometimes those people get a little crazy with their stuff because they want to say, hey, come over to my side. I'm going to convince you with fear or I'm going to convince you with, you know, crazy propaganda. So yes, they can cause cancer, but I think that it's just like anything, right? So when a client asks me this question, I tell them honestly, I tell them it is UV light, whether it's an LED lamp or a CFL lamp, it doesn't matter. It emits UV light. Um, the equivalent of UV light, if I recall correctly off the top of my head, don't quote me on this, but the studies that I've read, if you do your nails every two weeks, and yes, UV light exposure is cumulative. However, if you do your nails every two to three weeks, the amount of sun exposure that you are getting when you get your nails done is about the equivalent of two minutes of sunshine, okay? So if you're out in the sun for two minutes, that's how much light you are exposing yourself to when you get your gel nails done. Um, and so that's, you know, there's been all kinds of uses of the UV lamp to be able to promote other products. So a lot of people in our industry started saying, oh my gosh, you know, gel is going to kill everyone. And so we are going to go with products that don't need ultraviolet light. So that's why, um, you know, the dip system stuff started coming up as people were like, we're going to use nail glue and acrylic powder instead. And it's full of vitamins and it doesn't need UV light and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, yeah, but it's still chemicals. It's still artificial product on our natural nails. So yeah, you might not have the UV light, but you're still exposing yourself to chemicals. Um, so that's kind of my whole thing is like, I like to believe in moderation. I know I'm going to die one day. I don't know how I'm going to die. And I like to be healthy and I like to live my life successfully and I don't want to deteriorate my health prematurely. But at the same time, I'm also very, very realistic about how um, a UV lamp, if I get my nails done responsibly every three weeks or so, two to three weeks, probably not going to die from my UV lamp. If I do my nails every single day, and I'm sticking my hand in there for 50 minutes every single day, yeah, that probably ups my chance of getting some type of adverse reaction on my skin. Is it guaranteed? No. But if I'm using all of the equipment that has been tested for this and that people have been using for decades, okay, decades, if I do it professionally and the way that it was intended with moderation, 
then I'm probably going to be able to use that successfully without having any crazy adverse side effects, okay? Same thing like with the tanning beds. You know, there's still people that love tanning beds. Um, and then there's that one lady that I saw on the news that she's like black because she goes to the tanning bed so much that her skin is like the color of my t-shirt. So yeah, there's going to be extremes on both sides and I'm all about moderation. I like to teach people about that. Yes, this can do damage if you misuse it, but if you use it the way it was intended, that it's been tested for, that there's been tons of studies about, you're going to get the equivalent of about two minutes of sunshine. And I always tell people to boil it down to something that you can like tell a client. I tell people getting your nails done every two weeks is about two minutes of sunshine exposure. You probably get more exposure on your hands driving your car. And that's the truth because do we wear gloves? Some people do, which I think is awesome. That's why I'm obsessed with South Korea because like they have visors and sunscreen and gloves and their skin is beautiful because they protect it. But the average Joe drives down the highway with their hands on the wheel, sun beating down on their skin. A lot of people like to lay out summertime, people are out tanning. You're probably getting way more UVA rays just being out and about with no sunscreen on your hands on a daily basis than you would if you got your nails done every two weeks, okay? So that's why even with the whole thing with like, should I put sunscreen on my hands when I get my nails done? Should I do this? Should I wear those gloves? Da, da, da. I'm like, well, do you wear gloves when you drive your car? Do you wear gloves when you go outside? Do you put sunscreen on the back of your hands every single day, every two hours or reapply? I mean, no. I mean, some people put sunscreen on their face and their chest and their hands in the morning, but do you really reapply during the day? I mean, sunscreen wears off. So when I start to ask them these questions, we're like, oh, I guess, no, I don't really do it at that level. And I'm like, well, then you're getting way more exposure from other things. Why are you worrying about the nail lamp that makes you happy and makes your nails pretty? That's my two cents. And you guys might disagree with me, but I like to drink a Diet Coke once in a while. I don't worry about that kind of stuff. I want to die happy knowing that I was able to eat a Twinkie when I wanted, or I drank a Diet Coke, or I did my nails. And I do it with moderation because I know that those things can be bad for me if I overdo it. But if I do it responsibly, I'm able to enjoy what I want to enjoy without any of those crazy adverse side effects. So I usually always coin it as, you know, it's about two minutes of sunshine every two to three weeks. That's how much exposure you're getting. Even with a little bit of over curing, you're not going to really make a huge difference in my humble, humble opinion, only my opinion. Um, and I think that, you know, if you want to enjoy getting your nails done, two minutes of sunshine is not a big thing. And most people get way more sun exposure just being out and about. So I don't know what people get worried about, but I do know that there are a lot of media outlets out there that have really sensationalized the whole gel lamp thing. I still see articles all the time about, oh my gosh, you know, this is like going to be the death of every single nail client. And I don't see people dropping like flies. I don't see people, their obituary, you know, died because she got gel nails. So as long as that's not happening, I'm not worried about it. I trust the people that manufacture this stuff. I've had lots of long-winded conversations with awesome, awesome manufacturers and they don't want their customers to die of using lamps either. I mean, imagine the company that makes nail lamps, all their clients die of cancer. They're not going to have any clients, right? So like they also have a responsibility to make sure that their customer is happy and healthy. Even if it's a financial responsibility, like they want to make money off of selling lamps. If you think about it in the black and white terms, a company doesn't make money if they kill all their customers. So that's why... I usually look to the manufacturers and have these conversations as well and ask them, hey, you know, what have you tested? You know, this, that, and the other thing. And I will cite, um, there's a really, really good study that was written by, I believe it's Jim McConnell from Light Elegance, who is, um, who is a chemist, and he's the uh, chemist for Light Elegance. He's the owner of Light Elegance. His name's Jim McConnell. But if you Google... Jim McConnell, Doug Shoon, UV lamp, I think, or something to that effect. The study will come up that they did. So Doug Shoon is another chemist in our industry. They did a paper together and they went through the whole UV lamp study. Um, and they, they also cited some references of like other media outlets that were talking about UV lamps and all of this stuff. But anyway, it's a really, really good article. It's in fairly layman's terms. So it's not, you know, crazy scientific talk that no one can understand. Um, so if you want to read some stuff, research it. You know, I think just like when I'm talking about e-filing and anything, I feel like this is a decision that comes down to every individual. It is okay to say, 
I don't want to get gel nails because it requires UV exposure. That's totally fine. But just realize that when you put any other nail product on your nail, you are exposing yourself to chemicals. So getting your nails done, period, to me, is putting yourself, you know, you're exposing yourself to something. Just like people who say, oh, I'd never put my hand in a UV lamp, but then they suck down Diet Coke 24-7. I'm like, that doesn't make any sense, okay? So I'm all about the moderation. I'm all about doing things responsibly, being educated about what you're doing, doing it properly. Um, and to me, I have not seen any crazy side effects so far. But that's also why I bring up previously about the allergy thing. To me, the biggest thing that is facing our industry right now is not the UV lamp issue. It's the allergy issue. There are so many people developing acrylate allergies because of overexposure, because of using products that are not good. And, you know, like HEMA is a big thing right now. Um, you know, super, super cheap, high concentrations of monomers and products is causing problems. So that's why I always tell people, if a product is cheap and you don't know the company that's making it, I always steer clear of that stuff because they have to cut corners somehow to make stuff ridiculously dirt cheap. And you don't even know who the person is that's making it or the company that's selling it. That's why I started working with companies, you know, through the Nail Hub, right? That's why we represent specific companies is because I know who's on the other end of that transaction. I know what's in the product and who makes it and how it's made. And, and they have, you know, they feel that responsibility to provide high quality stuff to their clientele. So that is why I specifically curate the stuff that I do is because I also want to make sure that I don't develop allergies with the stuff that I love to use. And I sure as heck don't want my fellow nail technicians or my fellow DIY or nail lovers to get allergies or any issues. So that is, you know, that is a big thing. To me, the allergy conversation, which has not happened yet in, in big terms, is more of an issue than the UV lamp issue. But I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with that. Okay. Using the overlay method, how often do you suggest soaking the overlay off and applying a fresh set? Once every several weeks, months after a certain number of fills, how do you know? Okay, this is a really good question. Um, one of the parts of this question about soaking off an overlay implies that you are using a soak off gel. You can also do overlays with hard gel, which you would not be able to soak off. So that's a very important thing. And it's also important to mention that you can do an overlay with pretty much any product. You can do an overlay with um, Acrogel, you can, or you know, people call it Polygel. Polygel, I think, is now like a branded name. Um, but Acrogel, um, you can do overlays with acrylic. You can do overlays with fiberglass, silk. Um, you can do overlays with dip powder. You can do overlays with gel. So overlay just means when you kind of put that semi-permanent, per se, or that, you know, layer of protective product that you're going to leave on the natural nail and you're just going to be backfilling it. That's basically what we mean when we talk about overlays, okay? So how often do you need to remove it? Well, it depends on the product that you're using. So if you're using a product that um, is intended for extended wear, like hard gel, I'll use hard gel as a really good example, or the builder gels that I've used on this channel, the soak off ones that I've used, they are low in solvents, and so they actually are very durable and they're able to withstand extended wear. I wouldn't do an overlay with something like shellac, for example, or you know a regular kind of gel polish, hybrid gel polish, because those products are meant for quick removal. Anything that says like soaks off super fast, or you know um, up to up to ten or fourteen day wear, anything that says that kind of stuff, I would not do overlays with because what that product is intended for is for that quick removal. It's actually for the opposite. It's so that people can put that product on their nails and get it off easily and reapply. And like I said, as long as you're doing it uh, gently, you can take off the product and put it back on, but that is where more of that damage can happen just from human error. So um, products that say up to blank days wear or um, quick removal or quick release or anything like that, I would not use those products as an overlay product because they're not intended for extended wear. But like hard gel, for example, absolutely intended for extended wear. It's made for artificial nails. Um, and you really don't need to remove it. And again, if you think about how long it takes your nail to grow out, your whole nail, um, as you're, as you're back filling, so you're like filing off the old color, you're probably filing off a little bit of that overlay as you do that process. And then you're back filling and reshaping. As you're doing that process every two to three weeks, 
you are shaving off a lot of the old product and you're probably shortening the nail because most people like to keep their nail about the same length. So you're probably adding product, shortening, adding product, shortening. So over, I would say a four, five, maybe six week process, you are refreshing that product almost 100%, almost. Okay, maybe not the base layer like all the way out here, but it's probably pretty dang close. So right around the two month mark, I would say, you've got new products on there. So the product is never getting older than about two months. Now it depends on the length of the nails because if you have nails this long, absolutely you're gonna have old, old, old product on the very, very end of the nail. But um, if you're talking about average length salon length or even average length extensions, every eight weeks, you're gonna get most of that product off um, and you're never gonna have product that's older than eight weeks. Now, that's just me kind of ballparking it in my head, um, but I don't think you need to remove everything at all because if you think about the whole process, as long as there's no lifting and there's nothing really major happening, then every eight weeks you're refreshing the product anyway in one given spot, okay? Hope that makes sense, like you're gonna have like brand new product on the cuticle area and then eight week old product out here. And so you're constantly going through this cycle as you're shortening and adding, shortening and adding. So I never take it off, to be honest. Um, maybe if someone wanted to take their nails off because, you know, for example, I've, I know that like now hospitals are saying you can't have any product on your nails because they want to be able to see your nail bed color. If you lose oxygen, you know, your, your nail beds usually turn purple, stuff like that. Like they, or, you know, they don't want you be, being able to harbor bacteria because of infection, whatever the case might be. Um, I do know there are scenarios where, where people who have had nails on for a long time need to take them off. Um, so that might be a scenario. Maybe the product gets exposed to something. So I've had that happen once where whatever, I, I actually had a nurse that I used to work on where whatever hand sanitizer that was like I swear it was like nuclear waste that they would wash their hands with, but they were required to do it every time they walked into a room or left the room. They had to put this stuff on their hands. I swear it ate the product. It was so crazy. It was like a super, super, super durable hard gel would turn into just rubber because of this stuff. And again, it's just chemical exposure. So that might be a reason why you take everything off more frequently is because whatever the person is exposed to that they cannot change um, is eating away at the product on a regular basis. That might affect the, the length of time you're able to leave product on. Um, but really, if the product is still in good shape, it's not lifting, it hasn't lost any of its properties, it's still the way it was when you applied it, it hasn't gotten brittle, it hasn't gotten yellow, it hasn't gotten rubbery, um, then I would say just leave it on because that whole backfill process, you're going to end up refreshing the product anyway. I hardly ever take everything off, hardly ever. And I've probably had products on my nails consistently, probably 20 years now, maybe more. I got my nails done when I was 14, I think, with the first time. And I mean, pretty, pretty consistently I've had nails. So 20 years, okay? Um, so you really don't ever need to take it off. Now, is it the same product? No, but I've had products on my nails consistently. My nails do not change underneath even when I take everything off. And, um, as far as the backfill process with overlays, I would say just leave the stuff on because you're going to end up refreshing it. The only thing I will say is that you might find that the product that you originally start using isn't great for extended wear. And that usually happens when people buy things without a lot of knowledge in the products. Um, or they haven't tried a lot of things yet, is that they end up using something that they think, oh, I'll just use this for an overlay, and it's really something that's not intended for that. The chemical makeup cannot withstand that aging process. Um, and so you might have things like yellowing, or it might get flaky, or it might get brittle. Um, and, you know, that, that can happen. And, and yes, I mean, our gel does continue to get exposed. So if you think about gel exposure, um, gel continues to cure for, I think, I can't remember exactly what the number is, but it cures for a little while, even after the nails are taken out of the nail lamp. And if you think about UV exposure out in the sun, once the monomers are activated and that whole, you know, the photo initiators are activated, it lights up the monomers and everything starts to come together and, and harden, um, it can continue to cure a little bit and sun expo you know, extended sun exposure can continue to make the gel a little bit more brittle can start to like, you know, really harden the bonds and break everything down. But I find that to be very minimal. Um, I've never had it be like where after several fills, the nails just start falling apart. 
but it really comes down to the product that you use. So if you're looking for just, you're always going to have the nails on, um, I usually do do hard gel because it just stands up to everything so much better. Um, or, you know, like the soak off gels that I've used here on the channel, they do withstand a lot of uh, wear and tear as well. But um, the only thing with soak off gel, especially soak off overlays, if the person is getting a lot of chemical exposure, um, and chemical, I mean anything, it could be makeup, tanning solution, um, even like Retin-A sometimes can affect um, gels. Um, any type of, you know, beauty products, soak off gel tends to get manipulated a lot more because it is a porous product and it does have weaker bonds. So just like acetone breaks it down, so other solvents can break it down as well. So cleaning chemicals, stuff like that, um, that stuff can change the overlay. And sometimes it does require that you need to soak that stuff off more often. Like maybe, maybe once every four to six weeks, you soak all that gel off and you put new on. Um, but it depends on the product. And that's why I usually say, if you're going to just continually get your nails done, I usually switch everyone over to hard gel. Um, I build it up and I kind of extend the nail so that, you know, their nail flexibility isn't impacting it. And they just keep that and they always have hard gel on their nails, but, um, it, it depends on the situation. Um, oh, here. Okay. So here is uh, here's kind of a, there's two questions, but they kind of both go together. What's the big deal with under curing and over curing? Can you really over cure? And then the second question from a completely different person is, is it possible to over cure the gel? I have a client that likes to just keep putting her hand back in the lamp until I am done with her other hand. Her nail enhancements, her nail enhancement is just popping off. However, she's a nail biter, but claims to have done to the nail. I don't, I think she's a nail biter, but claims to have not done it to the nail or have done it to the nail. I'm not sure. Um, but the over curing issue. Okay. So the real issue, if you want to break it down is the under curing issue. The under curing issue means that the product has not fully polymerized, which means it has not fully come together and hardened and made that final polymer. Polymers are essentially in layman's terms, a form of plastic. Okay. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to take a liquid that has photo initiators in it, which photo initiators are the things that are sensitive to UV light. They are the things that start the chemical reaction. And then we've got oligomers and monomers and all of these, and they come together and they form these bonds and then it becomes a solid product. Okay. And when that happens, I've talked about this before, but when that whole process happens, heat is released and that's the exothermic reaction. And I'm talking about this in very simple terms, but essentially what happens is when we under cure product, some of the gel might polymerize and it might come together and form bonds. But in between those bonds, even if the product feels hard to the touch, there might be uncured product in there, which means that there's monomers in there that are not actually cured into anything. They're not touched, you know, they're not bonded with anything. Um, there might be other chemicals that have not actually converted and bonded. And so you may be able to, through your skin, um, and having that exposure with that uncured product, you may be able to absorb some of that. And that is how we develop allergies. So the real issue with under curing, if you think about it, is the risk of developing an allergy because the chemicals that are supposed to be completely done and they're supposed to be completely hardened, they aren't. And they're still kind of out there and they're still able to be absorbed in your skin. And this is probably one of the biggest things that happens in the gel industry is the lamps, um, you know, especially again, buying a cheap lamp, a cheap lamp may not be able to cure your product. And it's not just the fact that it's going to be sticky and gooey and it's never going to cure. It could be that your lamp is not fully curing your product. And so wearing around under cured product could potentially cause a problem. Now, does it always cause a problem? No, but that is a risk. And that is something that from a liability perspective, a lot of manufacturers are very concerned about because they intend, you know, they've tested their product with their lamp, right? So if you go and buy a different lamp that's cheaper because you don't want to buy their lamp, or maybe you own lots of brands and so you just go buy some cheap lamp, um, now you've kind of added this element of you don't know if the gel is fully cured. There are visual tests that we can do. There's like things like tensile tests. I've shown you guys on my channel, like how do you know if gel is cured? Um, but do we know it's fully cured? No, maybe the gel is only 70% cured or 80% cured. And believe it or not, some of the statistics I've heard from other manufacturers is that most of the gels on the market, even with the lamps, because most lamps, the manufacturers don't make their own lamps. They get them from places like Taiwan or China. 
Um, and they do order the lamp specifically to be able to cure their gel. But um, there's so many little nuances with lamps, like how many extension cords you have it plugged into and um, you know how old the LEDs are or how old these CFL bulbs are or how reflective the surface is. And it, there's just so many little variables that in general, most gels don't cure past 70 to 80%. That's what I've heard, okay? Don't quote me on that, but that's some of the conversations I've had is that people are discovering that a lot of gel is only 70 to 80% cured. It's not up into the 90s like it's supposed to be. Um, and most manufacturers, when they test their product, they want that gel to be cured. I believe it's like past 95%. So again, this is just Liz off the top of her head, okay? Um, but there is that element of under curing and the manufacturers are concerned only because they don't want that to become a serious problem. Um, most of the allergies really are coming from people using product that they don't know what's in it. Um, most of the allergies are coming from touching the uncured gel. So most people get allergies not from wearing around under cured gel. They get the allergy from the gel touching their skin. Um, and usually it's like when we use our brushes and we're touching our brushes with the product, whether you use acrylic monomer or use gel, um, touching your brushes with product. Now you've got it on your skin. You wear that all day long, um, getting dust from finish filing or especially acrylic because acrylic actually can take days to fully polymerize. So as you're finish filing acrylic, you get it on your skin. That's not fully set up yet. Um, most of it I would say is not from the under curing. So if you cured something for 20 seconds when you should have cured it for 30, it's probably not going to be that big of a deal. Um, I can't guarantee that, but it's probably not going to be that big of a deal. Um, and then the over curing part of it is Overcuring people, the main concern is that it might change the properties of the product. So a gel that was supposed to last four weeks might only last three because it becomes more brittle. Um, sometimes the gel can yellow because the photo initiators usually do turn yellow when they get kicked on. Um, usually the yellowness fades after a little while, um, almost like glow sticks. That's what I usually think of when I think of photo initiators is they kind of get like hopped up and then they fade. Um, but sometimes it can cause the gel to prematurely yellow, to become brittle. Um, you might get product breakdown. That's what they call product breakdown in general is that the product that was intended to last X amount of time starts to fall apart on you in some way or another. So the overcuring really, it can be an issue if you're talking about the quality of the service, but I honestly have never, ever, ever seen a service breakdown because I slightly overcured it. I'm not talking about like sticking your hand in there for an hour. But I'm talking about like if you cure it for a few extra minutes, most of the time if you're using a high quality product, you're not going to see that much of a difference. Um, and with gel specifically, usually gel does stop polymerizing at some point. So with acrylic, it can be, I mean, I, acrylic can be like days and days and days that it continues to harden and continues to harden. Whereas gel, usually the polymerization process stops. Um, and so you can only cure it so much. The one thing I would say about over curing also is just the amount of UV exposure. So like I said, if you're following, you know, the instructions and you're, you're curing within that range that you're supposed to cure, um, then you're getting that same amount of UV exposure that you're expecting. If your client is keeping their hand in the lamp the entire service, they are upping that UV exposure. So that might be something to tell the customer is that, hey, this gel only needs to be in there for a certain amount of time. I usually use analogies like cooking analogies, like you don't want to overbake a cake, it gets dry, right? So same thing, it only needs to be in there for a certain amount of time and then you can take your hand out. And if they don't want to accidentally touch their clothing or the table or something, have them put their hand on top of the lamp. Um, or have them put their hand just on top of, you know, the table or something like that. Or I used to have people just like put their elbow on the table and just keep their hand up in the air. Once the gel was done curing, it just kind of kept them away from dust and hair and all kinds of stuff. Um, so if they're worried about touching something accidentally because their nails are sticky, just have them put their elbow on the table and have them put their hand up. That's usually a comfortable position or have them rest their hand on the, the lamp if you have two lamps. Um, the overcuring issue is less of an issue. The only thing I would say is that UV exposure, we want to keep that to a minimum. We want to make sure that that's within the range of what we're expecting. Um, but I haven't really seen any major side effects as far as the product. The undercuring thing, you know, it can be an issue. Um, I don't think it's the full culprit of why we're having allergic reactions in our industry. I think the allergic reactions are coming from two different things. They're coming from nail technicians getting uncured product just 
plain old gel or acrylic or monomer or whatever on their skin as they're working. Um, and you really don't realize how much you get covered in product until you really start looking at the end of a seven hour, eight hour day. You're like, oh my gosh, I have gel all down my arm. I have gel on my hand. I have you know dust on my face, on my chest, on my arms. So it, it really is a matter of how much you're getting exposed to. And then the other thing that happens is when we clean those nails, which I've shown you guys before in previous videos, a lot of people clean the nails like this and they slide all that uncured product up the client's finger. And usually clients don't wash their hands after their nail appointment. They usually put cuticle oil on and walk out the door. So you've got that uncured gel on your nails. Um, and so that's why I always tell people, you know, wiggle back and forth just on the nail plate and pull straight down so you're not getting that uncured product on the actual skin. So I would say those are more of the issues. But yes, there are some things that can happen with undercuring where you don't have the product fully hardened. And there could be chemicals in there that seep out per se, um, especially if it's touching the skin. Your nail plate doesn't really absorb things like that. It doesn't really absorb into your bloodstream through your nail plate, but it does, it can absorb into your nail plate or absorb into your body through your skin. And then the overcuring, I would say the two biggest issues would be number one, the amount of UV exposure you're getting, which is more than what we're supposed to do. And again, if you're doing things like 10 seconds more, 30 seconds more, a minute more, it's not going to be that big of a deal. But if someone is keeping their hands in the lamp the entire hour appointment, then I would say, you know, that needs to change. Um, and then secondary would be the potential that the product could become more brittle, yellow, change on you because it's been over cured, over processed, just like a cake that gets too dry. Same idea. So those are two questions in one. Um, let's see here. Can I pinch my natural nails? This is a really good question. The answer is yes, you can pinch your natural nails. Um, what I would say is that pinching your nails does not really work very well if you have nails that are super, super short. And I'm gonna actually, I've got this on my list and I need to do it, but I've got an actual just pinching video I wanna show about a before and after of like a non pinch nail and then a pinch nail and do like different lengths so you guys can see the difference. So I have that on my list. It's just, it's so, I mean, you guys probably know, it's like just to even make a video is a lot of work and, um, and I love doing them, but it's just a matter of like getting them up on YouTube and doing all of them. And half the time you make a video and you're like, I don't like the way it turned out and then you don't want to upload it. So I need to just get this video on there, but I will do it. But yes, you absolutely can pinch natural nails. Um, the main thing with natural nails, or if you want to pinch a natural nail that maybe you didn't pinch, but already has product on it, the big thing is you need that nail to be flexible again. So, um, either thin out the product a lot so that the nail is bendy again, even with hard gel, if you make the gel really, really, really thin, you'll be able to pinch the nail again, or, um, grow out your nails just a little bit because if you have nubbins, and you're trying to squeeze the sides of your finger, you're not really gonna pinch your nail. You're gonna end up just squeezing the sides of your nail bed. So in order to pinch natural nails, you do need to have a little bit of length. And I will absolutely do a video on pinching nails because I know that is a big question. And a lot of you guys, when you watched my previous video about apexes and C-curves and, um, and about pinching nails and all of that, you guys weren't aware that a C-curve actually has a structural element to it. A lot of people thought it was just aesthetic. So that was cool to put that out there and have you guys see that C-curves actually do play a key role in the strength of our nails. So I will definitely get into that more. Um, someone asked, so you can't use the same base coat, top coat, and different gel polish. So this is a product mixing question. Um, yes, you can mix and match. And I've said this several times on my channel is, you can mix and match products. So you can use one base coat from one company, a color from a different company, and a top coat from a different company. But why do I tell you not to? Well, because most people don't know enough about the chemistry of each product or the formulation of each product or haven't tested it enough in order to know how those things are going to behave together. Most of the time, the issue arises with that inhibition layer. The inhibition layer is that layer of sticky gel after you're done curing your nail, it's usually sticky. That sticky layer is actually uncured product. It's the gel that was exposed to oxygen while it was curing, and so it's uncured gel, and that gel has a specific formula to it. So all the gel underneath is cured, but there's this teeny, teeny, tiny layer that was exposed to oxygen, and it won't cure. And that's usually the layer that we take off at the very end of the service with rubbing alcohol or with our gel cleanser. Um, so that uncured gel, if you think about it, has its own chemical formulation. And if you go to put some other chemical formulation on top of that, 
Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it goes on flawlessly, you never have a single issue, maybe because the gel formulation is very similar, or sometimes it's literally like oil on water. And you'll know immediately, you'll start painting the color, especially color, on base coat, and it will just pool in the middle. It'll all pull away from the sides and the edge. You won't be able to get it in place and you'll be like, oh my gosh, why does it keep moving? Why I paint it perfectly and it goes whoop into the center of the nail. So that is because the gel that you're putting um, on top is not compatible with the gel that's underneath. And that sticky layer is uncured gel. So yes, you can take off the tacky layer and you can paint on the, you know, the, the cured gel and all of that, but it just, it adds steps. And above all, when you mix and match, it adds unforeseen consequences. It adds variables. And when I mean variables, it means lots of little things that you're putting together and hoping that it all comes together and works properly. It's kind of like cooking without a recipe. I never cook without a recipe because I have no idea how that's gonna turn out. Like baking a cake off memory, nope, can't do that because I would never know the amount of stuff to put together. And to me, doing nails with lots of different brands is like cooking without a recipe. You have no freaking clue how that's going to turn out. And if it doesn't taste good, guess what? It's on you. And if those nails don't last, it's on you. And it also can have those issues where it's under cured, it's over cured, the stuff peels off, especially if you're doing nails in a professional setting. I just tell people for the sake of your business, don't dabble, just find a brand that you love and stick with the one. And yes, I know as nail technicians, we get creative and we wanna mix and match, or we love this base coat, and we love that top coat, and we love this color. And yes, you can mix and match. I mix and match all the time. But when I did clients, I actually didn't mix and match on the same client. I might use a different brand on a specific client because I found that that product worked well for them, but I would never, do one base coat, one color, one top coat, one prep, one primer, one blah, 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 because you just have no idea how it's gonna turn out. And I never wanted my client to leave and have that risk of that stuff not working. The other additional reason why I always tell people don't mix and match is because guess what? You are on your own. The moment that you mix and match, especially in a professional setting, no manufacturer of any of your products is going to back you up because they can't. They haven't tested all the permutations of how many combinations you could possibly make up with all the different products that are out there on the market. So the moment that you call up and you go, hey, your nail product fell off of my client after three days, I'm PO'd, and they go, okay, please explain your process to us, and you're like, okay, well, I used this base coat from this brand, and I used this color from this brand, and this top coat from another, they're gonna go, well, you mixed and matched, like, we can't help you. So that's the other thing. If you want to kind of get that guarantee per se from your product manufacturer that you're purchasing product from, which is a big investment, don't mix and match because they're not going to be able to back you up. So anyway, yes, you can dabble, you can mix and match, you can get creative, do it on your own time, do it on your own nails, or even, even better, get yourself a fake hand and do all of your experimenting on a fake hand first before you ever touch your real nails because then you'll be able to see what works with, with what. And yes, you can mix and match. I know for a fact there are colors in certain brands that don't exist or it hasn't been made. Um, and so you might wanna use that with whatever other system that you've got. But what I usually do is I try to mix that color with the products that I have. So when I was working on clients and like, let's say I knew that I used, um, I don't know, Cocoist on that person or something. Let's just say Cocoist because I just saw it out of the corner of my eye. I use Cocoist on this client. I don't next time come and use a different base coat on her because I know that that stuff is working. So if I wanted to use a different color, I would do one of two things. I would either completely do an overlay artificial nails, whatever, remove that inhibition layer, finish file the nail, and then use whatever brand of color I wanted and then use the same brand of top coat that goes with that color because now I've got finished layer of one brand, clean, finished, filed, and now I can add a completely different layer with no chemical issues in between. So you could do it that way. Or the other thing I usually do is if the client wants a specific color, maybe they bring in a nail polish bottle that they want to use or a gel polish bottle that they want to use. I actually used to make that color out of the colors that I had. And I would just make a small quantity. I would write down the formula of like this many drops of this, this many drops of that figure out the color formula, make the color, and then keep that color for that particular client. So those are the two ways you can get around it. Either 
completely remove the chemical incompatibility by working only on finished, cleaned, hardened gel, and then do whatever color and top coat and art you want on top of it, um, or you know, mix the color out of the products that you actually own. That way it stays all within the same family. But I usually tell people, don't mess around with your base and your overlay layer. Um, your base coat is a big deal. And if you're doing base coat color and top coat, I usually tell people don't mix and match at all because those three, so many things can go wrong. Gel polish is finicky to begin with, so don't mess around with that. But if you're doing artificial nails, I always tell people, if you're doing artificial nails, use the same base that matches the same builder gel you're gonna use. So base and builder and all the prep products underneath, same brand, then you can clean the nail, finish file the nail, you've got that hardened, finished product, and then you can do whatever brand of color and top coat you want on top of that. So that's the other way around it, okay? But I always tell people just for the sake of your sanity, don't mix and match very much because it just, it creates so many problems. And if you're a business owner or you're a nail technician or whatever, it's just, it's just a heartache. It's a heartache and it's a headache and it's just annoying. So I usually tell people just why even add that? Why even add that into things you need to worry about? But I understand it's a thing. Um, let's see. What is bio rubber vitamin base gel blah blah blah? I was kind of like, what is all this stuff mean? Okay. I've actually had this question a lot. Um, the whole like bio rubber vitamin infused blah blah blah. Um, so bio, bio is usually used as a marketing term in my personal opinion. Again, this is Liz's personal opinion. Um, bio is usually used to explain, it's a, it's a marketing word that they use to explain that they want you to think that their gel is organic or healthier or more natural or, um, you know, more high quality. So bio is just a word that a lot of companies use because they want you to think natural. They want you to think organic. They want you to think of, you know, this is something that should be, you know, on your nail and, uh, and it's fine. And it's just a word. Um, people use it for marketing terms and that's basically why you would see something that's bio. I've even seen people say like bio and it, you know, cures in the sun and it's organic and it's chemical free and it's blah, blah. First of all, if you want Liz to go on a little bit of a rant, every gel on the planet will cure in the sun. Okay. We use UV rays. So if you see a marketing company or a company that uses the marketing term cures in the sun, of course it cures in the sun. It's UV sensitive product. So I always look at that stuff and I'm like, really? And then, you know, they say things like, um, it's organic. And I'm like, yeah, of course it's organic. Cause everything's organic. Everything's carbon based. So of course everything is organic. And if you want me to get really nerdy, yes, it's everything can be claimed it's organic. Chemical free is just a joke um, because everything is a chemical. Water is a chemical. So you can't say chemical free. I think that's silly. Um, rubber is a term that is used to really just describe flexibility. So I know that the whole rubber base thing just became huge, especially across Eastern Europe. And then it kind of started coming over here to the US and Canada. It was like this rubber base. And it was basically a base and builder in one that you could make an overlay with. So the, the rubber base I saw was a very flexible base coat or a high adhesion builder gel, let's say. Um, it's basically a one-step product that you can put as a base coat and also build an overlay or an apex on the nail. Um, and it was very flexible and very high adhesion. So rubber base just means a high adhesion, flexible base and builder in one. That's what rubber base is. Rubber top coat would be a very flexible top coat that probably goes with your rubber base. So again, there's not really rubber in it. Um, I guess you could say all gel is plastic and rubber is plastic. So you, I guess you could say that all gel is rubber or all rubber is gel. I don't know. Um, but I mean, the whole rubber thing is just a marketing term, in my opinion. Um, vitamin. So there are vitamins that are put into a lot of our products. Vitamin E is a very popular one. Um, there's all kinds of vitamins. And I know that there's a lot of things out there that are saying it's vitamin infused, full of vitamins, nail vitamins, whatever. The only challenge with the whole vitamin thing is that our nails don't really absorb vitamins. Our nails are basically keratin um, and it's dead material. I mean, it's, it's just like hooves on a horse, right? Um, so 
it doesn't absorb anything. We don't really get vitamins through our nail plate. If you wanted to take vitamins to help your nails, take vitamins internally. Um, but topical vitamins, especially only on the nail plate, it's, it's been proven that it doesn't really do anything. Our nails don't absorb things like that. So it's, if it's vitamin infused, I mean, I guess it's better than nothing, but I mean, it doesn't really do anything like that. Um, it's usually, again, it's just like an added bonus that, you know, people are like, oh, it's got vitamins in it, you know, and it's supposed to be healthy. So a lot of these things are marketing terms. It doesn't mean that they're not true. It doesn't mean that, you know, what they're saying that, you know, that vitamins aren't in it or that vitamins aren't, um, you know, uh, healthy or that vitamins don't help the situation. That's not necessarily what I'm saying. I'm just saying that a lot of these things are just marketing terms. And a lot of times the companies don't choose these things to swindle you or something. It's mainly because they're trying to think of a way to describe their product to the general public. So they're trying to think of like, what would be a word that if someone saw it, they would go, oh, I get it, right? So like rubber, you put the word rubber with something, people are like, oh, okay, I kind of get what rubber means. Rubber means like it's flexible, it's rubbery, you know, it's it's kind of, it like has traction. So rubber, I mean, is a good word to describe something. Bio, what do you want your people to think about when they talk about your company? You put bio in the word, people are going to think natural, they're going to think healthy, you know, so it just, it kind of, it kind of brings up feelings when you talk about certain words. That's why people say words have meaning is because they do. When you say things, you know, these descriptive words in marketing and advertising, the whole idea behind the words is that we want people, we want to incite a certain response. And so when you say things like that, you're trying to get a feeling from someone and that feeling is what you're trying to associate with your company or with your product. And that's totally fine. That's Part of advertising and marketing is trying to differentiate yourself and trying to get people to think of a specific thing when they see a word associated with your product. So that's basically what they're trying to do. But at the end of the day, it's a marketing word. And at the end of the day, pretty much gel is gel. Different properties of gel, you know, high adhesion, shiny, durable, hard, soak off, whatever. But at the end of the day, gel is pretty much gel. All right. Um, hi again. I've been watching your videos over and over as I'm trying to fully understand. The video is amazing. Can you please tell me where the watts come in? My lamp states 48 watts. Thank you again. All right, so I know that the wattage thing on lamps is really confusing, and I talked about this in a previous video um, about UV lamps, and I found a really, really, really good description online, um, and so I wanted to use this, and I was trying to think of a good analogy, and I couldn't think of one, and it's been way too many years since I took um, an electrical class. I used to, um, I studied electrical engineering in college and sometimes these things you just like forget what would be a good way to explain something to someone when they're learning it for the first time and I found a really, really, really good way to explain this. So um, I'm going to quote it off of, uh, off of this website. If we think of electricity as water flowing through a pipe, it can help us understand amps, volts, and watts. Okay. Um, the water pressure, so if you think about how much water pressure is coming through the pipe, that would be the voltage, okay? So really a lot of pressure would be a ton of voltage, and that's why when you have high voltage, it electrocutes you because there's just so much, there's so much force, right? So much pressure. Um, watts would be the power the water could provide. So if we think about the ability to like turn a turbine to create energy and that water being able to create power, that's what wattage is. And so wattage is like the potential of the electricity to create UV light in the case of our lamps. Um, and so it kind of does have a correlation to the power behind the lamp. And um, an amp, um, an amp would be, um, an amp would be the, ex uh, wait, where's the amps? Oh, sorry, amps would be the volume of the water. Okay, so volts is the pressure of the water, amps is how much water there is, and then watts would be how much power that water can create or how, how much potential that water of the power, the potential for power that water can create, sorry. Um, and so these three things, if we think about amps, volts, and watts, um, it does kind of help us understand how electricity is. So if you think about your electrical cable as like a water pipe, you've got the volts running through it, which is the pressure of the electricity running through the cable, how much you know power it has running through. And then also the watts would be how much power it's able to produce as far as generating UV light inside of our lamp. And so that is a big deal when we're talking about wattage. So wattage, 
when we're talking about actual UV lamps, it kind of has two different um, two different things here. Watts can mean how much power it can produce, but usually what it refers to also um, when we're talking about just like the words that you're going to see on a box, usually every LED has a specific wattage to it, and so depending on how many LEDs are inside of your LED lamp or your hybrid lamp, that's usually what they'll put as the wattage because that's how many um, that's how many watts each LED is. That's in my experience what it is because I haven't seen many lamps where they actually put the wattage and then you know they, they don't talk about it in reference to the LEDs. Um, but in general, wattage higher wattage means a more powerful lamp in general okay there are exceptions to that rule there is um there is a difference between led quality there's a difference between the type of light emitting diodes that are used and the reflectors that are in them and you know the type of uv light that's emitted and stuff like that so there is there is definitely a difference um, between lamps and even a lamp two lamps that are 48 watts one might actually have more curing power than the other because of the way that it's wired, the LEDs that were used, you know, what type of LEDs they were, what type of reflector it has, does it have a reflective interior on the lamp? So it's really hard to compare lamps when you say, okay, well, this lamp is 48 and this lamp is 50 watts or this lamp is, you know, 36 or whatever. A 36 watt lamp and a 48 watt lamp might actually have the same curing power because the one, the 48 watt lamp that's cheaper might have cheaper parts. And so they need to make it a 48 watt lamp in order for it to cure at the same level as a high quality 36 watt lamp. Um, so there's a lot of nuances to it, but what I will tell you is that a high quality lamp is not going to be cheap, okay? I have never, ever, ever seen a high quality gel lamp that will actually cure 99.9% .9 of gel products on the market. I have never seen a lamp cheaper than $75 that will actually do that. Now, lamps do get expensive and obviously you get what you pay for. In most situations, if you're spending a premium on a gel lamp from a manufacturer that matches the product line that you're using, that money is going towards a good cause because now you're getting the guarantee of your product, you're getting the support of the manufacturer, you're getting something that you know is supposed to work with your products, you know you're, it's gonna cure your products properly, so it takes a lot of that risk out of the equation. When you go for some $40 cheap eBay, Amazon, AliExpress, whatever lamp, you're rolling the dice because even if it says it's 100 watts, you have no idea how much UV light is actually being emitted by that lamp and there are actual um, sensors that you can put in a lamp and it'll show you how much UV light is being emitted. Um, but I mean, is everyone gonna buy one of those? No, so the general rule is, well, there's two general rules. One is don't go super cheap on your lamp. It's just, it's a bad idea. I know that a lot of you are gonna go, well, I can't afford an expensive lamp. I get it, I get that lamps are expensive, but it's like anything. You buy cheap, you're gonna buy it multiple times. It's not gonna work properly. And I still believe that the quality test stands. If you invest money in something that is high quality, usually the quality is there. Very rarely do you spend a lot of money on something and it's not high quality. Now there's varying degrees of that, but in general with a lamp, if you spend a good amount of money on a lamp, it's not going to fail on you. And if it does, and you're using the same lamp as the product that you're using, usually the manufacturer backs you up. Like any of the lamps, the professional lamps that are 200, 250 bucks, the manufacturer guarantees those lamps for a year. If you buy a cheap lamp off of eBay for 40 bucks, who guarantees that lamp if it, stop wor it stops working? And I guarantee you're gonna buy two or three of those lamps to get them to work properly. I did that when I first started as a nail technician. I bought cheap lamps. Our gels wouldn't cure. Our products broke down. The lamp stopped working. I mean, it was just a disaster. So I always say buy quality when it comes to your e-file and buy quality when it comes to your lamp. Because if you're doing gel nails, those are the two most important pieces of what we do. And the rest of it, you can go crazy. Um, but yeah, I hope I hope that analogy makes sense for you guys. And I'll repeat it one more time very clearly because I know I kind of fudged it up the first time. So amps would be the volume of water flowing through a pipe. If we think about electricity flowing through the cable, like water flowing through a pipe, amps would be the amount or volume of water that's flowing through that pipe. The water pressure would be the voltage and the watts would be the power the water could provide. So think about water being able to propel a mill or to turn a turbine or something. That's what watts would be is the amount that it's able to power something. So I hope that helps you kind of get an idea of what amps, volts, and watts are. 
and that's why wattage is used to describe lamps. But again, the wattage doesn't necessarily tell you how much UV light is being emitted. And it doesn't tell you how it's going to cure your particular gel because you didn't formulate that gel and you don't know the photo initiators that were used, the monomers that were used, the oligomers that were used, all of that stuff. So that's why I always tell people, unless you want to get into chemistry and you want to take all that risk onto your own shoulders, just buy the lamp that goes with 90% of your product. If you own lots of different brands, but you have like one main brand, just buy the lamp that goes with that, that brand because you're going to cover pretty much all of your bases. Um, and if you're like me and you're crazy and you own way too much stuff, you're going to own like 12 lamps. I, I swear to God, I own like 12 lamps at this point. Um, so anyway, I hope that helps. And the wattage thing, you know, again, usually, usually if you guys are looking for baseline things, okay, I'll kind of put some general rules out there. Usually a 48 watt lamp or higher will cure stuff. That's not guaranteed, but I will say that in general it will. Most professional lamps are 36 watts because they use very high quality product inside. They use very high quality LEDs, so they're able to emit a lot of UV light without needing that much wattage. But if you're buying a cheaper lamp, I would not buy anything less than 48 watts, and I certainly would not spend any less than $75, because anything less than $75, you're probably getting a big hunk of crap. So, Liz's little two cents on that. Um, and then I've got a whole list of other videos I've got coming up. I wanted to give you some insight into what I'm going to be making. So I had a lot of you guys ask me about painting on, um, pastels or semi-transparent colors because you get bald spots. So I'm going to make a video about how to actually paint on, some of you were like, paint a house, polish a nail. Okay, so polish a nail with pastel or semi-transparent or whatever. I like to say paint, polish, whatever. Um, flash carrying, I still need to do a, a full video on flash carrying. Filing your opposite hand, I know a lot of you guys have been asking me about that, especially if you're doing your own nails. Fixing common issues with extensions and when to start over, what you can fix in the, in the middle, you know, how you can fix things on the go, or do you need to completely file everything off and start over with extensions. Shape changes, shortening long nails, backfilling, removing a lot of lifting without hurting your client. This is one of the ones that I did not know how to do when I was um, earlier in my career. I did have someone like bang their nail really bad. It was lifted like almost all the way down and I was so freaked out because I was like, oh my gosh, how do I get this off without hurting her? And it was super painful. So I want to go over that kind of stuff. Like how do you work on nails that are sore or someone injured it and they want to get the nail off? Like what do you do? Or maybe even like extreme lifting. Like what do you do when someone comes back and like their nails lifted all the way down? Um, and then I wanted to talk about how to remove hard gel nails because that is something that I know a lot of you guys are interested in. If... You guys have an idea for a video that I have not covered, and the caveat to that is you have to have watched all of my gel nail fundamentals videos. If you have not watched every single gel nail fundamental video from beginning to end, you are not allowed to make a video recommendation. Um, no, I'm just kidding. You can. But I'm, uh, I really would like you guys to watch all my videos first before you guys start asking questions because I'm sure that I've answered it somewhere along the road. And I get it, I get that people want to start with the new video and they don't want to go back to the beginning, but please, please, please go back to the beginning of my gel nail fundamentals videos. Please watch them from the beginning. The quality gets better, I'll tell you that, because when I first started posting these videos, I had some technical issues which I have resolved. Um, but if you have ideas for videos, please let me know. I would love, love, love to make a video that answers your specific question. And I've also gotten asked, how do I ask you a question for one of your Q and A's? please put your questions below any of my videos. I do read every single comment. Um, and so I want to uh, be able to answer any questions you guys might have. All right. This has been a long video. Thank you for sticking in there with me. Um, and I wanted to wear this t-shirt today. I thought it was very appropriate because I'm ranting. And uh, that's what Liz said, basically, is my theme for today with the Q&A. And I will be in touch again next week with another awesome video. All right. Bye, guys. Oh,